So how are you guys doing? We're going to do something a little different today. We're going to team teach Chris and I today, and we get to sit down, which is going to be hard for Chris yes, because <laughs> he's going to eventually just get up and run around the stage, and we just ignore him when that happens. I'm That's actually fair. going to push my notes over here so it looks like both of us are using notes when we <laughs> preach. It's a little intimidating to me, uh, but glad you guys are here. All right, well, let's get started. I worked at a summer camp when I was back in college and law school, and it was awesome. I made just enough money to convince my parents that it was a real summer job, but I got to hang out with kids and do really cool stuff for the summer. But before the kids got there, we had a, you know, an orientation where we had to learn how to be good counselors. But another thing we did was help get the camp ready. And so we'd mow like, I don't know, 60, 70 acres of grass, a lot of it with push mowers, but also with tractors. We'd, you know, prepare the cabins. We'd make minor repairs. But one of the assignments that some of the guys always got was to be wasp busters. The camp would set idle for, you know, nine months out of the year. And so during that period of time, wasps would come into the cabins and the, uh, the bathhouses and build big nests and live there. And so we had to go clean those out. And so you, if you got the assignment to be a wasp buster, they'd give you lots of cans of wasp spray. But for some of us guys... Spray wasn't quite enough of a challenge. We wanted to make sure that we were manly and we were tough, and so we would choose to fight the wasps with tennis rackets. I know, tennis rackets, fighting wasps with tennis rackets isn't quite as smart as it sounds, but I'm not scared of a wasp. Well, my second year at camp, we got the assignment, and I was part of the wasp busting team. There were three of us, and we got the assignment to go take care of what was reported to be a big wasp nest in one of the bathhouses. And so we grabbed our tennis rackets and some spray. We headed to the bathhouse and we got there. It was huge. It was like the size of a basketball. It had like 70, 80, I don't know how many wasps, a lot of wasps. And so at that point I was thinking, you know what? Maybe we'll just use the spray. But then one of the other guys, he, in fairness, he, he challenged my manhood a little bit. And he, he gave me uh, what's called a double dog dare. Now, if you're not from Northeast Texas, you don't know what that is. You can refuse a challenge. You can refuse a dare, but you can't refuse a double dog dare. And so he said, I double dog dare you to fight all them wasps with a tennis racket. That's exactly how he sounded too. So at that point, I had no choice. I had to accept the challenge. And so the three of us, we stood kind of angled back to back. And then the double dog dare, he had a rock and he threw the rock and hit the nest. And when that happened, wasps were everywhere. It was like, if you remember the movie Star Wars, it was like TIE fighters protecting the Death Star. They're flying in at different directions, and my pulse is racing. And what seemed like hours, but was probably less than 60 seconds, we, uh, we decided that wasp busting with tennis rackets probably wasn't a good idea in that circumstance. And so we grabbed the spray and sprayed the nest. And then very bravely, we ran out of the bathhouse and waited for the wasp spray to work. Now, the moral of that story is that there are strengths in numbers. I'm not scared of one wasp, and a tennis racket can handle one wasp, but 70 wasps, that's a different story. I, you know, I have heard too many stories of your childhood at this point, and it is a wonder to me that you have lived as long as you have. <laughs> I'm more intelligent than that. Well, a little bit. <laughs> we'll give you some credit. Uh, but hey, if you have your Bibles or Bible apps, you guys can go ahead and turn to Hebrews 10, and that's where we'll be mostly today. And we're kicking off community groups in two weeks, and we wanted to talk with you guys about groups today with some of that same understanding, that navigating a meaningful Christian life can be really difficult when you're battling hardship and temptations by yourself, but there's still strength in numbers. And the writer of Hebrews actually encouraged us a couple of chapters later in chapter 12 to live out our faith by saying that we're surrounded by a cloud or a great number of witnesses. And here's what he's saying with all that is that we're not alone. There are tons of Christians who came before us. In fact, some of them were the same people that wrote the scripture that we read today. And that's a really awesome thing. But here's the reality for us. We need more than just the knowledge of Christians that came before us. We need brothers and sisters in Christ who will walk through us with life right now as we learn what it looks like to follow Jesus. And so as we walk through that process and we learn what it looks like to follow Jesus, a really big part of that is that we would learn to grow, to be confident that the promises of God are true. Promises that he's with us in the mountaintops of success, but 
he's also with us when life gets hard and promises that he loves us, that he'll never leave us, and that he'll always be there for us, and he'll return one day. And the writer of Hebrews actually says it this way in chapters 10, uh, verses 19 through 23. He says, therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain, that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess for he who, is, who promised is faithful. And so back in the Old Testament, when you talk about God and the presence of God, the high priest was the only person who was ever able to be in the presence of God. And the catch was that he could only do this one day out of the year. And this was what we call the day of atonement. And so what would happen on this day is the high priest, after going through some preparations, would be able to enter into the Holy of Holies. And this was the place where the presence of God presided and where the Ark of the Covenant was. And it was separated from the rest of the temple with this huge thick curtain. And so as the high priest made his way through this curtain, he would have done so with this sense of fear and trembling because if he messed up even just one piece of that entire preparation, he dropped dead right on the spot. And so the problem here was that he's a sinful man trying to enter into the presence of a holy God. And if you like to keep your life, that doesn't usually work out for you. And so what they would actually do during this time is they would tie a rope to the leg of the priest so that if he did something wrong and he died, they could literally just pull his body out without killing themselves in the process. But here's where we're different. The writer of Hebrews says that because of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross and because of our faith, that we're actually able to enter into the presence of God with boldness and confidence. Because on the cross, Jesus took all of your sin. He took all of the sin from your past, but he also takes all of the sin that you'll commit for the rest of your life. And because now God, when he looks at Jesus on the cross, he sees all of our sin in a perfect Jesus. When he looks at you, he now sees Jesus' perfection in you. And so because of that sacrifice, we're justified and made right with God. And so unlike the high priest, we're actually able to enter into a very close relationship with God with confidence and boldness. But that still takes effort. Look at what uh, the writer said back in verse 22. He said, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. And so essentially what he's saying here is that this, this is going to take some effort, that a big part of us learning to follow Jesus and drawing near to God is that we would grow in our confidence to God. But there's also a big part of it that we're supposed to grow to look more and more like Jesus. And this is a big church word that we use sometimes. It's sanctification. And it's this idea that we're to be slowly transformed to think more like Jesus and to speak more like Jesus and act and love more like Jesus. And really, that's the whole goal of our entire faith as we live this out. And that process is a really, is just a lot easier for us when we have Christians who know us and support us, who can walk through both the successes and failures of that process. And these are the same people that'll be there for you when life gets tough. You know, I love the way Barbie said it last week. She said that we really can't look like Jesus unless we're involved in biblical community. And I think that's so true because community is crucial to our growth, that all of the fruit of the Spirit is grown in relationship with others. And so if you're sitting here and you're thinking, well, you know, I just don't really have time for community or community groups, and I don't really know if I need that, and I don't know if I'd get anything out of that, well, I would challenge you that you're probably missing the point on community and community groups, and you're missing out on what it looks like to live and look like Jesus. Because the reality is for us is that we can't really look like Jesus unless we sacrifice for others. Because that's what Jesus' life looked like. That Jesus lived an entire life of pouring himself out for others and teaching people how to live. And ultimately, he willingly gave his life to die for our sins. All right, let's look at the next couple of verses of this uh, chapter of Hebrews. This is verses 24 and 25. It says, And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. So after the writer of Hebrews tells us that we're to boldly enter God's presence, to look more like Jesus, he then tells us how we can accomplish that 
as a group of believers, how we can live in community together. And, and I love the way he phrases this. He, he doesn't say, consider how you can be encouraged by other people or consider how someone else can spur you on. Instead, he says, consider how you may spur someone else on. Consider how you may encourage other people. The challenge there is for us to serve and live for one another. And what's obvious from these two verses is that even the early church, the Christians there were allowing the busyness of their life to keep them from meeting together the way they were supposed to, to encourage and spur one another on. And so the writer of Hebrews is encouraging them and reminding them how important this is. And it's just as important for us today. We need to get together to challenge one another, to build relationships, uh, to support one another. So if you're sitting there asking yourself this question, well, what will I even get out of life groups? Well, I don't know why I just said it like the guy that was in East Texas. But if you're sitting there saying, what will I even get out of life groups? I'd challenge you in a couple of ways. First, I would say, you're asking the wrong question. That's not the right question. And secondly, you might be surprised what you get out of life groups if you go in with the right attitude. So you may think you're living a pretty good Christian life. You pray every day, you read your Bible, you've got friends, and so what do you really need life group for? But the point is, you're missing the point. Here's the better question to ask, what can I do for someone else in community group? See, there, there may be someone in your group that needs help understanding the Bible. There, there may be someone in your group that needs to learn how to pray, and you're the person that can help show them how to do that. There, there may be someone that needs a mentor, or maybe they just need a friend. Maybe there's somebody that needs to see what it looks like to live out a Christian life, and you can show them what that looks like. Or, or maybe there's somebody in your community group that really doesn't even know Jesus, and you're the person to share your faith with them. The stakes are actually a lot higher than what you think they are. And can I, can I be really direct with you for just a minute? You cannot have the mindset of Jesus if you go into community groups thinking, what will I get out of it? That's just not the mindset of Jesus. The mindset of Jesus is, what can I do for other people in my community group? We start to look more like Jesus when we think less about what we get out of a certain situation and more about how we can serve others and we can encourage other believers to think more like Jesus, act more like Jesus, and live more like Jesus. Philippians 2, 3 through 8, in, in this passage, the Apostle Paul is kind of telling us what the correct lens to look through our relationships with other people should be. In other words, how we should think about those relationships. And here's what he says. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself, not looking at your own interests, but each of you to the interests of each other. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. See, Jesus was not looking out for himself when he went to the cross, and so he died as a sacrifice for us. And then we're called to live our lives as a sacrifice to God and to sacrifice our lives for other people. And so in a community, we can pour into other people to encourage them to live out their faith. And you might actually be surprised what you get out of community groups if you go in with the right focus and the right attitude. You know, one of the great joys for me as a pastor is seeing someone that I played a little part in their decision to follow Jesus and be baptized or, or I'll see a couple that are happily married, and I get to remember the, the little part I played when I counseled with them hmm. when they were struggling. Or maybe I just have a conversation with somebody that I've mentored or counseled in the past, and I get to see how far they've come in their relationship with Jesus. It's an incredible joy for me. You, you guys may not realize this, but on Sunday mornings when I get up to preach, I'll get up before uh, I get up to preach, I'll that during that last song, I'll go over to the side of the stage to head up the stairs. And, and sometimes before I go up the stairs, I'll look out at you guys. And what I'm usually doing is I'm thanking God for the blessing that you are to me. And, and sometimes I'll even tear up when I see somebody that I got to play a little part in them following Jesus or their relationship with their spouse being better than it was before. The joy I get is seeing other people's lives changed because I sacrificed a little for them. 
The Apostle Paul says this same thing in uh, a letter to the church that he started in Thessalonica uh, during his second missionary journey. Now keep in mind, these words are written to Christians who decide to follow Jesus because Paul took the time and the effort to preach and teach the gospel to them. This is 1 Thessalonians 2, 18 through 20. He says, for we wanted to come to you, certainly I, Paul did again and again, but Satan blocked our way. For what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. See, Paul is saying that in this life, his joy is found in the people that he played a little part in their decision to follow Jesus. And so what you may get out of life group, a community group, if you go in with the right attitude, is you may get to play a part in someone else growing in their faith or maybe even deciding to follow Jesus. You may make an eternal difference in someone else's life. Yeah, and for others of you, you may be on the other side of that. And you need other Christians who can encourage you to grow in your faith and grow in your marriage and grow in as a parent. And some of you may just need to learn what it looks like to pray and study Scripture and live a life that's more like Jesus. And, and here's what I love about community. Biblical community, when it's done right and it's healthy, there is a beautiful relationship that we develop with one another where we benefit one another by encouraging and spurring each other on. And so as you do that, you'll have moments in your life where people are pouring into you as you work to grow in your faith and to grow more like Jesus. But you'll also get those same opportunities where you get to pour in other people's lives as they walk through something difficult or they're struggling with sin. And, and I think that that's such a beautiful thing to know about community that you get to make an impact in people's lives. And the flip side of that is true is that as you impact people, those same impact people will impact you. And it's this beautiful symbiotic relationship that we develop. Well, I want you to see something. Uh, we're going to watch a video in just a second. And, you know, you may be sitting here thinking like, well, what, what ways can I impact somebody in a group anyway? If you want to get even just a small, and I mean small glimpse of what that can look like, check out this video. We're Michael and Rebecca Miller. This is our daughter, Violet, and we've been at the church since the first service last Easter. Our daughter sleeps during church. Once she got started getting older and naps started becoming more of a thing that we needed to be a little more rigid on, a little bit more routine on, her naps were falling in the middle of church. And so we felt like we were missing out on the community at church. And so when the opportunity arose that we were able to do the community group, and be involved, we jumped on that and we even wanted to host it so that we had a, a chance to connect with other couples but while also being parents as well. The Cullums were really, they're family to us and so they have been instrumental in the churches we've been a part of, the communities we've been a part of, groups we've been a part of um, and so them moving was was hard. Them, before they left, they introduced us to you, know, to you and, and Hannah and Sean uh, and that helped us as we uh, started this journey and started going to these groups to make those connections. And um, now I see y'all more than I see some of our other friends we had before we started doing these groups. And also you're even getting together with some of the guys to do D&D &D night and some of the girls too. So it's getting you out and doing something social, which is really good for you. And I've also been connecting with the women, uh, with Mac and Hannah and some of the other girls, and even went to the women's ministry bunco night that I would have not known if they didn't say something at community group, which is good for me as a mom, a first time mom. I need to make friends, and that was really important to me that I was able to get out and do that. You know, you can, you can read the Bible, you can hear a sermon, but being able to deeply dive into it and talk through things and make connections in your life with the scripture that you're reading and talking about, I think is is very helpful. If you're on the fence, just knowing that like people have your back for stuff. Like if anything ever happened, like you have people praying for you, the people actually know you by name, they know you by heart. And so having that village is so important and people that you can communicate, talk to and confide in is so much more powerful in my opinion. Like to be able to look back after a year and say, we were able to do almost every single Sunday together, that we had a meal together, we dove into the Word together, and you know, developed and strengthened these friendships. Um, I think that's what I'd like to see, and then you know, see us all continue to progress through life together and have that, that bond and that friendship and that 
um, be strengthened. That was a, a huge part of our spiritual journey as well with, you know, Kate and Dustin before they left was, you know, we were close with them when we had Violet, when they had their girls. And so seeing us all progress through those major milestones in our life and doing that with um, other followers and with, you know, they say it takes a village. And so we, we love our village and we want to continue growing it. So I've had the pleasure of kind of, most of you know this, some of you don't. We've kind of been running a, uh, a test group, if you will, for about five or six weeks now. And so the Millers are a part of that group with us. And uh, one of the things that I love just in talking with them and being in that group with them is, is seeing the way that having that community has impacted them. But on the flip side, how it's impacted us, that they took up the time to open up their home, to feed us, and just to build that community has been so great. And, and that's the thing that I hope you see about community groups as we talk about them today is just that they are a game changer, that healthy biblical community makes a great impact in the lives around you and it makes a great impact in your life. And you get to play a really big part in people's spiritual development and just in keeping them connected with other believers. And so don't miss out on that. Become a part of that community and watch as God does some really crazy things with that. So if you hadn't figured it out, today's a, a little bit of a different Sunday than normal anyway. And so we're, we're going to take the last half of this sermon, series, uh, this sermon to do something a little different. We've talked a little bit today about what the Bible says about biblical community, why it's important, and how groups play a part in that. But we want to take the rest of this time today and just talk through some of the reasons that you may still be on the fence about groups. And, and I'm going to be brutally real with you for a second. These are excuses. Now, not saying they're bad excuses, they're just excuses about why you may not be in a group yet. And so we want to be able just to talk with you guys about this and just answer some of these questions. So here's the first one. Nathan... I don't have time for groups. Yeah, we understand that time is a precious commodity. You have 168 hours each week, and, and I get that. Look, I have two jobs and a family, so I understand how precious time is. So if you work 40 to 50 hours a week, hopefully you sleep close to 40 hours a week, that doesn't leave you a lot of hours, and we understand that. But I don't want you to think about what you're giving up by that one night a week you spend, but I want to th you to think about it as what am I sacrificing for? We've talked a little bit about what that looks like, but you also got to see a video of, of a couple and a young family who've been impacted because they've stayed connected even with uh, going through the struggles with their daughter uh, sleeping right in the middle of church service. But we also understand this issue, and so we've, we've tried to structure community groups in a way that they're a little shorter than what you may have had in the past, uh, and we're also trying to be very flexible. So when you sign up, you're not signing up for a particular day. You're just going to uh, possibly give days you're available or not available. And then we'll start putting those groups together on days that make f uh, sense. So we want to work through that. All right. Well, here's the next uh, thing. Chris, I'm nervous about a community group. And I get that. Here's the reality is that new things, they're hard. And building a community, it's going to take effort, intentionality, honesty, and like we talked about a second ago, it's going to take time. And so doing all those things when you have something that's so new and there's so many unknown variables, that can be a really difficult thing for you to be a part of and to give that next step. And so I just want to encourage you real quick. I want to read two verses. These are the very two ver uh, beginning verses of Philippians 2. And it says, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, and being one in spirit and of one mind. And, and here's what I love about these verses, is they're this really neat reminder to me that the unity and the like-mindedness that we find in a healthy biblical community, they were created to be a great comfort for us, and they were created for our growth. And so it's really cool for me to see this played out in the, the lives of some of our church members. You know, I've had the pleasure of recording some stories of our church members and how they've been impacted by groups. And so you saw one of those a second ago, in a few minutes, you'll get to watch another one with the Haldi family. And as I've talked to them about this, you know, there's this common theme that just consistently comes up with this. And it's that the groups were something that both encouraged them, impacted them, and it was a huge comfort for them to find those connections with believers as they gave up time and other people poured into their lives. And so it's this really neat process that we get to walk through. And Paul even says at the end of this that it is a completion of our joy when we find ourselves in that healthy biblical community. And so my encouragement to you is that I'll be real with you. Building that community will be tough. And there's going to be th times where you don't know if it's going to happen and it may feel difficult to take that first step. But give groups a try 
and see if they can't be something that's so great and so powerful for you. Now, how about this very real concern? Am I stuck with these people? Some of you may be asking the same question about your spouse right now, or maybe your kids, and the answer to that question is yes, you are stuck with them. But groups is different. We're not going to hold you captive in a group. Uh, what we would ask is that you don't decide it's not the right group for you after the first or the second week because you may show up and people are very different than you, but then you realize over a few weeks that you can develop really cool relationships with people that don't necessarily look like you or that are in your st same stage of life. But if you decide that this isn't the right group, just have a conversation with your group leader, express your concerns to them, and then let us know that you want to change groups. Make sure and let your group leader know that you want to change groups so they don't just think you fell off the planet or something. All right. How about this one? Here's another reluctance. I tried groups, and it stunk. And hey, here's the deal. If you feel that way, we've all been there. You know, I've been a part of some groups that were just horrible. I mean, they felt like they drained me more than they gave me life. And I can't tell you the amount of times where I'd walk in a room with some of those groups and go, I, I feel like we're just a bunch of random people that showed up at the same place at the same time. But the flip side of that has also been true, that I've been a part of some groups that were so fulfilling and so life-giving. And they not only helped me to grow spiritually, but those healthy groups are what got me in the church in the first place. And they've also given me some of my closest and deepest friends as we walk through the highs and lows of life together. And so you may be on the other side of this. You may be thinking, well, I didn't really have that bad of an experience with the group. Like I felt like I connected with the people pretty well, but I just, you know, I didn't really experience much growth. There was no like major spiritual breakthrough or anything like that. And, and if that's you, that's okay, but I want to encourage you that that's probably just the life cycle of your faith. You know, if you think about it as if you were, say, a farmer, then you'll have seasons where you reap. You'll have seasons where you're benefiting from people pouring into your life, where you're going to grow and you're going to experience some major life change in that. But you're also going to have seasons where you're supposed to be the one pouring into other people, where you're the one putting in that effort. And so I want to encourage you to take that opportunity that if you feel like that group, that you may be one of the more spiritually mature, that's okay take that effort and that time to pour into other people because I promise there's still growth in the sowing seasons in those moments. And, and really, here's the big challenge overall with this particular reluctance is I would challenge you not to project your negative expectations of a previous experience on something that's new. Because the reality is groups may have been really bad for you in the past. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's fair. But give our groups a try and see if they can't be fulfilling community like they were meant to be. And I'd also say this, just so you know, that if we walk through this and we figure out that our model that we planned out for you guys just isn't as effective as we want it to be, we're not completely stubborn. You know, we understand this is a new ministry, and that means that there are growing pains with that and maybe some things that we need to tweak and develop as we go. And so know that we are committed to making this as best and fulfilling an experience as we possibly can for you guys. Now, this last one is one that I think that we all feel more than we care to admit sometimes. Nathan, it is not the right time for me to join a group. Here's the deal. <laughs> it's never going to be the right time to join a group. If you look at all the different things you've got going on and try to decide, is this the right time, you're going to say no. There is never going to be a time in your life when you're sitting around with nothing to do thinking, boy, I wish I could add one more thing to my life. The right time to join a group isn't when all the stars align. The right time to join a group is now. And you might actually be happy that you did. Check out this video. This is Mike and Juliana Haldi. And we've been going to Care City essentially since the beginning of uh, when it was open over at the White Church. We moved to Houston not knowing anybody except for a couple people that were, you know, family. But outside of that, we didn't have anybody other than, you know, my work uh, colleagues. But you know, moving into some place that's very intimidating and obviously stepping into a place where, you know, you start to develop relationships at church and then go into small groups and be able to, you know, see that flourish and develop the relationships that really, you know, kind of fill that spot in your life, I guess, you know, is, is what's encouraging for us. We were on the fence at one point, you know, before we decided to become part of a group and I mean, I'm glad we did it. I mean, it was intimidating. I was intimidated. I don't know. <laughs> I can do this. <laughs> Trying to, like, get to know people and watching all of our kids. It was a typical small group, and people were going through 
different stages of their life with kids or without kids or you know young couples so you know and some of them are in different stages from a uh, um, perspective with where they're at with their walk with Christ and so it was just a lot of different perspective a lot of people were much more scholarly or biblical than others and much more read but but I think kind of what made it special to us was that there was a quick connection with kids and wives and and um, you know, really that drew the families together that, that really clicked. And out of that, I would say we had, you know, two or three families that we really connected with. And, and you know, from that point, it, it wasn't just a small group. It was, you know, we were doing life. We were, it was not just one day a week where you're meeting, going through whatever the study was. It was, you know, we're talking about other things. We're meeting for coffee. The guys were meeting for coffee on Friday mornings. And then it built, it spurred from there. We were taking vacations together and re really just really good friendship. And, and you know, that, what the special part about that for, for me was that, you know, you, you knew there was some good, valued, moral people that are in your life that you, get, you could talk to about, you know, anything that you needed to. So, you know, that, that to me was special. Yeah, we quickly went from just like basically like another. Sunday morning on Wednesday night to really like doing life with these people and really essentially they became our family and you know, just the level of trust and accountability that you get from a group like that when you really just are real with them it's just yeah you just have that group that you can just lean on. I think just the openness and everybody's there for a, for a good reason I mean people want to be involved with that um, to grow themselves I think more than and to connect. I mean, I think a, a big part of that is just the connections and the opportunity that there is for other people just to lend you a hand and to help with whatever you are that you're going through or with you know, anything, any of the, the things, but just to grow your relationships with people. It can't hurt. I mean, it can't hurt. We were with each other through the good, the bad, and the ugly. You know, we were there for a family that was going through some really hard stuff, and they were there when, you know, we had some stuff. and. They're just there. But then we also celebrate the good things. I mean, it's just, yeah. When you're just really real with people, it's just, and can really have the time. And I mean, it takes effort, but I mean, when you put in the effort just to get to know people, it's just, it's a really good thing. There are a lot of reasons to not be in a group, and we've talked about some of those. But the reason to do it is to develop community to have friends that are there to celebrate the good stuff, but also to support you and encourage you and pray for you when things are tough. That's the reason. There are several couples here at Kara City who are here in part because I was in a community group with them and we got to know one another. You, you do life together. That's how it works. Community group sign-up ends today, so right after church, you can go right out just to the left of the doors. There's a table there with a sign. You can ask whatever questions you've got. You can sign up. If there's days that you can't do it, you can list that as well. We're going to take then a week to make sure we get everybody connected to the right group that works for them and do the very best we can for that, but get signed up. Um, you may have seen the email that I sent out on Thursday. We're c contemplating or thinking about a, a special group a marriage enrichment group. And so if you're a married couple and you're struggling right now, maybe you're going through something difficult, or, or maybe you're in a marriage that it's surviving, it's just not thriving the way you hoped it would, or you just want to make it better. We're going to think about having a, a special group that Lil and I will lead, uh, but we need enough couples to make that worthwhile. So if you've got an interest in that, that same booth, make sure and tell them you're interested in that marriage enrichment group. You have an opportunity to get involved in Christian community, to encourage and love one another. I, I told you at the beginning the wrong question, which is what will I get out of a community group? Here's the very best question you can ask yourself. What will God do in me and through me if I get involved in Christian community? Let's pray.